I spend a lot of time thinking about physical objects. My grandmother had a lot of them. Toys, games, knickknacks, junk from TV infomercials, decorations, statues of snowmen. She had a lot of statues of specifically snowmen. It was a, a whole thing for grandma. And when she died, all that stuff was divvied up among her kids and grandkids. We all went to the house and took the things that would remind us of her before there was an estate sale. And at the time, the house I was living in was pretty cluttered already. I had a lot of things and I didn't want to be someone who had a lot of things. I didn't want to be someone who was sentimental about objects. So I just took a thing that I thought would be useful and that's a, a set of juice glasses. I've been drinking out of these glasses my entire life. I said, well, I will use these. So this is the thing I will take and will remind me of her. But you know, that house didn't get cluttered on accident. I had a lot of things already, including things my grandmother had given to me while she was still alive. In particular, two books and a board game. Uh, one of the books is Uncle Wiggily's storybook. Uncle Wiggily was uh, a bunny rabbit gentleman, elderly rabbit with rheumatism, and was one of the most popular characters of the early 20th century for some reason. The past is weird. Uh, this book's from 1939. My grandmother's mother read these to her and then uh, gave it to her and then she read them to me. Uh, specifically, she read them to me up on Beaver Lake where she had a little place during the summer and I'd go up and visit her and there wasn't a bed for me but there was an inflatable canoe and I was a skinny little kid so my grandmother would blow up the canoe and I'd snuggle in there and she'd read me one of these stories. And, you know, I don't have children to read this to these are not stories that are compelling for an adult. Um, why do I still have this? This book is a rhetorical grammar of the English language. Uh, basically, it's an English guy telling you how to pronounce words in English. Not a very useful book. It's pretty boring and there's a lot of anti-Welsh racism. That's not great. But what this book is, is a 200 and 41 years old. Uh, the oldest thing I've ever owned. I have no idea how my grandmother got a hold of it. She doesn't didn't know either. Um, but that's, that's this old book. A cool thing about this is that on the inside, uh, we have a subscriber list. These are the people who paid for their copy in advance to fund the production of the book. So it's kind of like a Kickstarter backers or a uh, Patreon. And among the names in this list is George Washington. That's, that's pretty neat. That makes the past feel a bit more recent. Now let's look at that board game. My grandmother had a lot of things in her backyard to entertain us. Hula hoops, plastic bowling bins, um, jarts. There's a lot of jarts in my childhood. I did not did not care for jarts. And then there was this board game which was there for years and no one ever played it because this is just tic-tac-toe and no one wants to play tic-tac-toe and if you do for some reason you don't need this. You don't need these these pieces and this board and these statues and like why does this exist? This is such a tacky thing and I think that's why I like it. I like that this is something that my grandmother probably picked up at a thrift store that does not have a reason to exist, but is done with, you know, some level of craftsmanship and she just, she just liked it and got it and I think that's why I like it too. Tic-tac-toe isn't the only pencil and paper game to be turned into something physical. Battleship was played this way for decades before someone at Milton Bradley found out they really liked pegging. It doesn't need to be a physical game, but it's less fussy this way, so this feels right in a way tic-tac-toe doesn't. I adore the tactile pleasures of a nice wood chess set, but I also recognize that chess doesn't really need it. Most people I know just play online. Last year, there were 35 million games played on chess.com per day. Other than the spatial relationships, there's nothing about chess that's inherently physical. 
In fact, playing chess without a board has become a stupid pop culture shorthand for brain genius expert. Rook takes rook. Pawn takes rook. Bishop to bishop seven. Queen. So we've got games like tic-tac-toe where the permanence and physicality of a set feels weird, and games like chess and backgammon where a set isn't necessary, but it's nice. There are also games that could only meaningfully exist as physical objects, where the design itself is dictated by its physicality. Connect 4 was created to be a physical object in three-dimensional space, subject to the laws of gravity. More than that, it was designed through physicality, through experimentation with physical implementations. Here's the creator of Connect 4, Howard Wexler. The idea came to my mind that what if the game were vertical rather than horizontal? All strategy games always played on the horizontal plane, like checkers, chess, parcheesi, whatever. What if it were vertical? And soon as that thought came into my mind, Connect 4 was born. Because then what I had to do was, well, how do I make a vertical strategy game? So that's when uh, I needed something to work this game out. And so I found a bunch of tubes. And uh, these are the tubes. And uh, I took these tubes and I set them up. Well, I've got two in a row here. And I got a possibility of something on the uh, vertical, and then maybe I could even work for the di to the diagonal. And I just kept on doing this. Now, of course, this was uh, before uh, there were home computers, so it was all by trial and error. Now, I am 30 or 40 years old, so I don't play Connect 4, and I don't find it compelling as a game, but I do find it compelling as design. It's such an elemental, elegant idea, and it's implemented perfectly. Because there's one more thing that really makes it work. I thought that once you had all these checkers in and we wanted to play another game, eh, it wouldn't kind of be cumbersome to just turn this whole thing upside down and spill out the checkers. It, 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 that wouldn't be uh, magical at all. We're always looking for that little magic, you know. And so what I did was I devised this mechanism. So what I'm going to do down, and this was this is the first model of Connect 4. Our release mechanism was to pull this thing towards us, and all the checkers would come down. And this release mechanism, believe it or not, is one of the reasons why it became as popular as, uh, as it is today. And we call this a fill and spill phenomena. If you ever see little kids play, when they're very, very young, toddlers, they build up blocks and then they knock them down. They build up things and they knock it down. Well, it's really the same principle here. They're... Wexler's background is worth discussing in this context. One of the men that I asked the most questions of was Dr. Howard Wexler. And uh, Howard is with us uh, today. Nice seeing you. Nice seeing you, Howard. Uh, for those of you who may not know, Dr. Wexler is uh, an educational psychologist. He brings a tremendous formal background. In 1969, he was inspired by an article in the psychology of toys to shift careers from education to games and toys. And incidentally, the doctor helped me get through the doors because when you call up a toy company, very often they'd say, sorry, you know, we don't want to see you. But I said, this is Dr. Wexler. And they said, Dr. Wexler, what the hell? We got a doctor coming to see us. <laughs> I think that that really uh, helped me at least get my foot in the door, you know? Working first at Pressman, then Hasbro, Wexler invented a number of toys before selling Connect 4 to Milton Bradley. These toys were designed with childhood development in mind. In 1970, at Hasbro, I did a line of infant toys called Your Baby, Growing to Meet the World. And because I was a PhD uh, in psychology, I was able to go to Brown University, get the latest research and such, and I invented a line of 18 developmental baby toys. Now this is interesting, 1970, you went into a toy store, you did not see baby toys. There were no baby toys. It, it began at preschool and up. So it was the first line of 
inventories. And what I did was I looked at the development of a baby through two years and I invented a toy to enhance the development of those months. So. When I say I don't find Connect Four compelling as a game that I want to play, but I do find it compelling as a design, what I mean is that I find it compelling as a toy. Its physical design, its psychological design, comports with the principles behind designing a toy, and those take precedence in my appreciation of it over principles animating the kind of game I want to play. Which isn't to say that board game design and toy design are separate things, or even separate processes. I got my start doing budget hex encounter games for magazines and ziplocs. It's a very restrictive format. The whole game had to fit on an 11 by 17 paper map and some cardboard square playing pieces. These are 5 eighths of an inch and 88 of them fit on a sheet. They're arranged on that sheet in 5 blocks of 16 and 1 block of 8. And after making some mistakes, I learned if I wanted to protect against miscuts, everything within a block should be the same color. Another mistake I made, another thing I learned, is that if a lot of pieces are going to be in the same hex, that hex needs to be larger in order to make the things usable by humans. This in turn impacts the scale of the simulation. People sometimes ask me questions about my process, which seems to assume that first I come up with a game and then I jam it into a shape that a production will allow, and that's not really how it works. These aren't separate disciplines when you're talking about making a physical object. That's probably why it didn't take me long to move from freelance design to publishing, where I would have greater personal control over that whole process. It's also why I have a lot of respect for something like Connect 4, where its physicality is central to its identity as an object in a game. I've done one game myself with this kind of physicality, and that's Islet, a game where you thread shoelaces through a series of irregularly spaced holes. It's as much a chill ASMR stim toy as it is a game, and the physical design took up much of the game's development time. I tried different lengths of laces to find the one that felt right. We experimented with different materials for the board to find the one that was the most durable and satisfying. In fact, the reason why the game went out of print earlier this year is the price of that material skyrocketed and we haven't found a suitable replacement. It kind of makes me sad because I hate to see it disappear. But I also kind of like how it makes it a finite physical object, like an old book or some weird game you might find in a thrift store. Like my grandmother, I go to a lot of thrift stores, not so much for knickknacks, but for old board games and vinyl. Yes, I'm one of those people who buys vinyl. The core of my vinyl collection are these command records. Anytime I see a command record, I pick it up. They took the music very seriously. They pioneered multi-track recordings and the dynamic use of stereo. They were basically the first snob label. A lot of the early command records come in a gatefold format with really detailed liner notes. And some of the early covers have really distinctive graphic design by the legendary artist, teacher, and color theorist, Joseph Albers. Albers was a graduate of and teacher at the Bauhaus, working in glass and furniture design throughout the Weimar era. He fled to America when the Nazis took over and taught at Black Mountain in Yale, where he was extremely influential. When I hear people talk about Albers, which isn't very often, I don't really travel in the same circles, they're talking about his work as an educator, about his paintings, and about his book, The Interaction of Color. If the furniture is mentioned, it's as a curiosity, a piece of trivia. Kind of like when people mention, oh, did you know the director of the Red Balloon designed Risk? And like, I get it. I don't know who designed this chair that I'm sitting in. The names aren't listed anywhere that I can find because we don't give furniture design the same value we give to paintings. I even emailed the manufacturer to ask, who designed this chair? And they said they couldn't tell me. Unless it's marketed as designer furniture and we pay a premium for it, we don't treat a chair as art. The aim of art is to reveal and to evoke vision. I indicate indirectly uh, that art is not an object, but art is an experience. I don't listen to these records very often, so in a practical sense, these are just objects. I'm more likely to listen to music digitally. 
I have a record player, but it's a cheap table with shitty built-in speakers, so I can't really tell if it's warmer or whatever. I just like having these. I like the care and artistry that went into them. I like how old they are. It's kind of the same thing with the board games I find at thrift stores. These aren't games I ever intend to play, except maybe once for giggles. I just like having them. A lot of what I find tend to be word games, and you would think these would mostly take place in the mind, but a lot of them have a surprising and sometimes compelling physicality. Option is billed as the double-sided word game. Each wedge has two letters on it. You get double points for a word if all the letters are the same color, and a bonus 25 each time you flip a wedge already on the board to form new valid words. It's kind of hard to do that in practice, but what a weird idea! At some point, the Scrabble people decided what Scrabble needed was a speed and dexterity element, and RPM was born. I'm going to be honest, it is pretty half-baked, and after you play it, it smells like the plastic is burning. Why does this exist? Who is this for? I don't know. Razzle is another speed game. First person to make a word pushes the rack towards their opponent. Get to the end, you score a point. With each push, the dice pass over these irregular bumps, causing them to tumble and change. Much like Connect 4, I don't really like it very much as a game, but I think the physical design of it is rather ingenious. But the best of these word games in my collection is duplicate ad-lib crossword cubes. You arrange these dice into a crossword and score them. That's the ad-lib crossword cubes part. Then you close the box, shake it, and exchange boxes with your opponent. That's the duplicate part. The lid is tight enough that it prevents the dice from changing their facing. So you each are using the same dice. And like, what a smart design, both as a game and as a physical object. In fact, it's what got me really thinking about games as physical objects, what led to me making Islet. Legitimately, this slaps. Get a copy if you can. It's such a clever and obvious idea, and I want to know how they came up with it. But I don't even know who they are. No one knows who made this. We don't know who came up with Option or who to blame for RPM. We know who created Razzle because it was a big hit. That one game sold so many copies that he got a new house. Good for you, man. For much of the 20th century, the creators of board games are anonymous unless their games are a hit or they're known for work elsewhere. It's only in the last 30 years or so that we started putting designer's name on the box. And even then, that's only really true in the hobby market, where we market them as designer games and often pay a premium for it. And that's largely because of the Coaster Proclamation of 1988. That's when 13 big-name German game designers signed this drinks coaster, promising not to sell games to publishers unless they were credited on the box cover, as the game's authors. That's the word they use in Germany, author. I call myself a game designer. Howard Wexler calls himself an inventor, so does Hank Atkins, that's the Razzle guy. And I think this difference in nomenclature represents a shift over time in the way we as a culture think about and talk about games. The word author, the act of being credited on the box, it frames game making as an art. The word inventor, on the other hand, conjures up something more practical. Invention is an inherently creative act, but as a society, we don't treat it like an art, we treat it like a business. It's one thing to come up with wonderful ideas, because I hear ideas all the time. I have a staff of people who work for me who come up with ideas all the time. The trick is to take those ideas and make money from those ideas. And when I say money, I don't mean that harshly. I don't mean to say that that is the measure of our worth. It happens to be that when everybody around here grows up and has to go out and make a living, you will find that success is measured by the fact if you can make a livelihood out of what you do. So for example, you might think you're a fantastic painter, 
but you're not going to know if you how good you are until someone is really willing to buy your painting. When I picture an inventor in my head, I picture someone selling something. Do you know you hate making salads? That's why you don't have any salad in your diet. Watch this one slap salad. This will be in a market in the spring, and everybody who's sitting here, I'm telling you, without even having to ask you, you will beg mom and dad for one of these things. You really will. And of course, these aren't two different things. Making board games is my livelihood. I do media appearances, and I make promotional videos to try to pitch them to potential customers. I'm an inventor and business person just as much as I am a quote-unquote artist. Even these video essays, which I'm doing for fun as a hobby, it's certainly not for the views, is an act of self-promotion just as much as it is an act of communication. It is commerce just as much as art because I want you to take my ideas and my work seriously as art, to take me seriously as an artist, to frame what I do as a simulation rather than as a toy. Because like author and inventor, there are different connotations to these two words. If you're a weird, fundy guy with terrible taste in hats, you can say that games can only be toys. You can't pretend they're anything else in order to dismiss games with messages and themes as being pretentious. On the other hand, if a game has a serious theme, you can say it's inherently trivializing it. You're taking something horrific and turning it into a toy, and isn't that ghoulish? Toy is used as a cudgel, and I understand why, rhetorically, we feel a need to distance ourselves from it. It's like that friend we all had who lost their shit when you called them comics instead of graphic novels, because graphic novels are mature and art for grown-ups, and comics, comics are for kids. Which brings us to the most tedious question in all of human existence. What, what is art, anyway? The definition I like the most is Scott McCloud's. Art is any human activity which doesn't grow out of either of our species' two basic instincts, survival and reproduction. In his book Understanding Comics, McCloud illustrates this with a caveman running for his life from an animal. He survives, and his next move might be to look for food, survival, perhaps another female, reproduction, but instead, art. It is a happy fact of human existence that we simply can't spend every waking hour eating and having sex. Personally, that sounds like a skill issue to me, but I've always found this definition to be very useful. This chair is art. The slap chop is art. This thing, this tuna, looks boring. Stop having a boring tuna, stop having a boring life. Add this tuna, put it here like this, now you're gonna have a nice tuna salad. Look at this, you're gonna have an exciting life now. Toys and puzzles and games are all art, and there's a lot of overlap between them. I think it's interesting to discuss those overlaps. In a previous video, I talked about the overlap between games and puzzles. And I've talked today about the overlap between toys and games, but what about puzzles and toys? Puzzles that are themselves physical objects, solved by play and interaction. I recently learned about the world of designer puzzles. Puzzles presented as the creation of artists with distinctive styles and ludic identities. I used this month's Patreon money to dip my toe into these waters, choosing two puzzles each from a couple of higher profile puzzle designers, Jean-Claude Constantine and Yu Asaka. The Constantine puzzles are made of wood and are mechanically intricate, while the Asaka puzzles are very minimalist packing puzzles made of acrylic. The object of this one is to free the tray. As you shift these bottles, you'll transfer these little metal balls from one bottle to another, which limit the movement of the bottle. Figuring out what you have to do, that happens pretty early, but then you spend a lot of time repeating the steps necessary to actually do it. I find that somewhat pleasurable in a stim toy kind of way. My partner Samhain had a very different reaction. Once she figured out the solution, she had zero interest in going through the steps to get there. I think that reflects a fundamental difference between us. I think for her, a game exists first and foremost in her mind, where for me, the physicality is more central. She likes games that are pretty and have lots of chunky bits for her to play with and touch, but she doesn't need it in the same way that I do. We play a lot of board games together, and because we're a couple of poor queers, we often play newer games through virtual tabletops, and for her, 
There's no difference between these experiences, the game remains the same. For me though, I often have trouble focusing and parsing the game state when it's presented digitally. Where's your third pawn gonna go? Here. Okay. See, I, did, I, did, I didn't put it on top of the tile. You literally or... did. It is absolutely... <laughs> I mean, is it though? Is it though, she says. I want everybody okay. to just like take this in, take this vista in. Y'all don't have the camera. I have I have her on my other screen. <laughs> she's so proud. She's so proud of the things she's done here. Look at this. I want to also say something while we're just while we're just not playing the board game here. So I generally do get more out of manipulating a physical object, the process of it. That said, I did find both of these puzzles, especially this lock one, kind of irritating. These pins move left and right in pairs while the two halves of the maze move up and down, but the maze won't move while a pin is in the way. The frame holding the pins obscures the bits of the maze, so as you're shifting it, you have to hold the shape of the maze in your head, and I have a lot of difficulty visualizing and holding spaces in my head. The goal of both Asaka puzzles is simply to fit all the pieces within the frame. So for example, I have these four black pieces and these six red dots, there's just enough room for the four black pieces, and depending on how they are arranged, their shared edges create a space for some number of dots, but not enough space for all six. I spent a lot of time going through different permutations, trying to find a solution within this framework, but my framework was wrong. There's a twist here, and it's really rather ingenious. So going into this one, I knew there's gonna be a trick to it, and in this puzzle, the solution is more subtle. The two puzzles almost feel like they're in conversation with each other, variations on a theme, like periods in a painter's work or movies from a director. There's an identifiable style here, a personality to the designs, and it's a personality that's definitely more my jam than the ones in these wooden puzzles. There's an elegance and sprightliness here that I really respond to, while the wooden ones felt a little kludgy. Now there is a place where toys, puzzles, and games all overlap and that's escape rooms. So I've never done an escape room. It's a lot of money. I don't do well with time pressure. I don't do well since 2020 with packed into a small room with other people. But my friend Tiffany sent me something which might scratch the same itch. Doom Mentions Pop-Up Mystery Manor, the demonic pop-up puzzle escape. Probably surprising no one, I've kind of always loved pop-up books. In fact, here's some Annabelle lore for you. When I was a kid, one of the things I wanted to do when I grew up was make pop-up books, a career path which is somehow even less practical than making weird, angry political board games. A lot of the puzzles here involve counting objects, which I don't find compelling, but it does involve interacting with the pop-up book, pulling open cupboards and doors, peeking around corners. I like that. Other puzzles have a more direct physicality, which Samwen and I found more appealing. I mean, I think it's fairly clever that you press the play button and it... Oh, yeah, okay. It's supposed to be a camera, and it's got the fold-out view. That's, so you can, that's cute. That is cute. They're done, I mean, they, I think they do a lot of interesting things with the paper craft of it. All the puzzle answers are expressed as a sequence of three numbers, which you check by feeding them into this wheel. Like those designer puzzles, part of figuring out the solution is figuring out the rules, figuring out what questions the game is asking you before you can find the answers. And these are not always the most intuitive. Sometimes the game wants you to count X, but you think it wants you to count Y, and you would think, okay, that's wrong, so let's forget Y. Except sometimes counting Y gave us two out of the three correct answers, so now we don't know. Is the other one wrong because we miscounted Y, or are we looking at this completely wrong? What's this shit? And this has happened multiple times. We got two right answers, but with the wrong method, to the point where it feels deliberate and kind of mean. You don't need to, it, needs, it doesn't need to be a focus. Don't focus on it. It's just a thing that's present and sharp eye viewers can notice. <laughs> it makes me want to yell to designers a little bit, which I wouldn't do, but I can't anyway because they're not credited. This kind of thing is pitched at a different audience than the designer board game crowd. The publisher's bread and butter are monthly subscription puzzles, kind of like the serial killer boxes that that one aunt of yours is really into. It wouldn't hurt them 
to credit the designers, other than it would allow me to yell at them, but it doesn't help them either because that one ant of yours does not care. It's not a useful framing for their intended audience. At any rate, so far Samhain and I are enjoying the thing, especially when the puzzles give us something to play with. It is that intersection of the Venn diagram. It's a game, it's a puzzle, it's a toy, all at once, and I do find that enjoyable. There's a story running throughout about disappearing paranormal investigators, some kind of demonic presence, and the writing here is as good as any board game on the subject. By which I mean the writing is fucking terrible. That's a little harsh. It's fine. The writing is extremely fine. Very workmanlike. It communicates information, but there's no pleasure in it, nor anything that really resonates or immerses. It's not fun to read in its own right, and outside of puzzle clues, it feels very separate from the game, and there is so much of it. Like I said, it's like most writing in board games. What's there usually isn't very good, and it usually doesn't connect to the game itself in any meaningful way. When people argue about puzzle toys and games, including video games, not being art, they often point to this. They argue if art is about expression, about emotion, about thinking about yourself and how you relate to the world, then how can these mechanical things and sets of rules be art? For me, that's a very limited view of what art is and a limited understanding of how games work, the way in which mechanisms function as metaphors. There's a kind of stubborn literalism that's applied to games, where people argue if you stripped away all the thematic words you use to label things, then what's left wouldn't express anything. It's a little like saying a book cannot express an idea unless it's expressed solely through the letters and sounds that make up the words, without, you know, what those arrangements of letters and sounds mean. It's phonesthetics, the study of words not for their meaning, but for the way they sound. If you look at a book solely through that lens, then no, it's not going to touch you. Games likewise create meaning by combining mechanisms, their framing, and your engagement. You have to meet these things where they are. Otherwise, nothing wonderful will come out of it. One of the nice things I like about it, I think is best illustrated with this airplane. Uh, these are kind of half toys. I, I, I've been calling them half toys for a long time because uh, the toy is only half here. The other half is here in the mind of the child. Art is not an object, but art is an experience. Can puzzles be art is one of the questions that animates Lorelei and the Laser Eyes, a video game that was released earlier this year. You make your way through a spooky, surreal mansion turned hotel, solving a series of nested puzzles. Solving one often gives you something to plug into another. Some of these puzzles take the form of physical objects, combination locks, clocks to wind, puzzle boxes, mazes, and interactive art installations. Others are manifestly not physical, but digital, traversing virtual spaces and triggering bugs in video games. The player character is herself a pioneering artist in digital mediums, whose work initially takes the form of physical puzzle boxes. The solutions to these involve interacting with her installations, solving that puzzle as you open the box, and that will reveal lost memories, bits of the artist's biography linked to the year assigned to the box. Now that's a very literal reading of it, and it's not entirely correct. Those lost memories were torn out of a biography that exists elsewhere in the game, which is set in 1963, but also set in 2014, so probably that's not what was in the boxes in 1953. The game builds in a number of ambiguities, things that function metaphorically and meld multiple contradictory meanings to make it impossible to sort it all out cleanly. Lorelei's work is met with a familiar brand of hostility, hand-waved away as toys that don't merit serious consideration. Curator and Catherine Braun states that the art of the future will require participation. The spectator will interact with the artwork, and perhaps even co-create it. The first wave of this so-called art is an exhibition called Verschlossen er Erinnerungen, spearheaded by Lorelei Weiss, a lesser-known artist from Frankfurt, who thought it necessary to litter a fine institution like Bauschinger with childish puzzle boxes that only the most fixated could possibly open. A fine product for country fairs, no doubt, but Fräulein Weiss's clothing and insistence upon wearing sunglasses indoors suggests that she has the hubris to think that her trinkets belong in the upper echelons of art society. 
The entire game is itself a giant interlocking puzzle box, a sort of sprawling escape room that's at once very physical and very much not. There's a clear sense of space, and you'll be backtracking through the hotel many times, but it also becomes clear that this isn't actually a physical space, but a simulation, or a fever dream, or a memory. It exists only in the protagonist's head. The entire game constructed by an elderly Lorelei for herself to play, to understand and confront her own past before she dies. A space she's constructed out of puzzles, metaphors, games, and alternate identities. Because that's how she sees and engages with the world, through layers upon layers. The game uses horror elements to create an atmosphere of dread. And in the game's ending, as you rush towards confronting the truth, a truth you, the player, have already put together hours ago, but that the character hasn't been ready for yet, the dread becomes exhilarating. It's a release. And after, you're left a little deflated, a little sad, a little lonely. And this is a game. This is a puzzle. This is a toy. And is also meaningful and thoughtful, thematically rich and emotionally resonant. Games, toys, puzzles, if you want to get all graphic novel about it, we can put all those things in a bucket called interactive art. And everything in that bucket is capable of being thematically rich and emotionally resonant. Often they're not, often we don't try, and to be clear, we don't need to always try. There is value in a simple idea that's well executed, and there is beauty in an intricate clockwork. But instead of putting them all in one bucket, we tend to put them in separate ones. One that we call art and the other that we roll our eyes at. One where we put the designer's name on the box and one where that person is forgotten. When this book was published, it was the tradition and still is to put the author's name in the book. And when this game was published, it was the tradition not to. Both these things are pretty obscure. This stupid book is never going to be reprinted. Neither is this game. It did not sell well when it came out. If it did, we would know who made it. It was published by the E.S. Lowe Company three years after a sale to Milton Bradley, and eight years before that company was folded into Hasbro. That happened 40 years ago. Maybe somewhere at Hasbro there's a file with a contract or some correspondence, something that could give us a name, but from what I've heard about Hasbro, I really doubt it. And almost 50 years later, there's a good chance the designer is gone. Maybe they're not. I'd love to be able to tell them how much I adore their game, that it inspired one of my own, that I wish I could come up with one idea as clever and as elegant as this little box. And maybe the designer of duplicate ad-lib crossword cubes wouldn't really care. Speaking for myself, as someone whose own work is pretty obscure, it means a lot to me when someone reaches out and tells me that my work touched them or mattered to them. There are nearly 20,000 games on Board Game Geek that do not have credited designers. And a lot of these are traditional and folk games, but there's quite a few that were made by people who were probably still alive when I was born. People within living memory. An entire generation of inventive, creative designers who will remain anonymous and unrecognized, whose work has been dismissed as just being toys. As if toys were not themselves, also art. This one was supposed to be shorter. It seems like every video essay has says that and now I'm saying it. So I guess in a year or so, I expect all my videos to be four hours long. This also took longer than I expected. I had a game come out in June that did really well in ways I was not expecting and I had to deal with the logistics of that. It ate up a lot of my time. Uh, but what I did do during that process is I made a couple of shorter off-the-cuff videos, things I wrote and edited in a single day, 
If you like those and want to see more of them between these projects, let me know.